Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Indian Military History Podcast, episode number three. Today we have with us our favorite infantry soldier, Colonel S. K. Dalal, retired from the Indian Army, served thirty-two years in the Army. Uh, also, my father. So, a, gl- a, a great pleasure to have you on. Thanks for taking out the time, Dad. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Great. It's a privilege. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. All right. So uh, today is episode three, episode one and two. We discussed uh, the military history of Pakistan. Uh, in the episode one, we went from 1947 till 1967. Uh, we went through Ayub Khan, uh, General Musa, General Yahya Khan. No, not General Yahya Khan. In the second episode, we went through the 1971 war, which included General Yahya Khan, and then we went through Zia, where we uh, were at 1984. We touched a little bit about the uh, for G Foundation, what happened in '84, but there's some more discussions to be had around that. In today's episode, we'll be, we'll be starting off in 1984 under President Zia, General Zia, President Zia of Pakistan, and then we'll uh, touch upon Kargil. And after that, we'll be going into the current situation, the current scenario within Pakistan, political, military, military, financial, and what are the various scenarios that can be anticipated in the upcoming time, one year, three years, five years, whatever it is. So uh, looking forward to this conversation. So let's start. So in last episode, we were at 1984. A huge event happened in 1984 where uh, the Siachen Glacier, it was not occupied by either of the powers. It was a disputed region. The territory was not defined properly. So it was whoever holds the ground will end up uh, holding Siachen uh, Glacier. So let's start off with that. What is the importance of Siachen Glacier overall? And uh, if you could briefly touch upon how that whole event happened and how the Indian Army was able to take control of that. Yeah, Siachen Glacier is uh, located at a place where it, uh, you know, it is between the Karakoram Pass and the Nubra Valley on this side. And uh, who's, whosoever holds uh, Siachen Glacier has a control over the entire uh, the Karakoram Pass region and the Nubra Valley too. And therefore, from there, access to Ladakh is uh, then that much convenient. It was uh, for some time there had been some activities by Pakistan um, armed forces to you know train their men to get hold of Siachen as much as possible. India got a hint of it. And the Indians under the famous mountaineer Colonel Narendra Kumar moved in before the Pakistanis, and uh, they occupied the higher heights of Siachen Glacier before the Pakistan Army could move in. This happened in 1984. The uh, after the 1971 war, the LC LOC, which was earlier called LOC Line of Control, it became LC Line of Control. LC it was called. And LC is was more uh, you know, defined. They had uh, clearly the both the sides had clearly defined LC till 0.9842, which is at the uh, beginning of the Siachen Glacier area region. And uh, from there, it was uh, laid down that the LC after that moves northwards. And it was not laid down on the ground. It was not put on paper. That is the uh, that was the you know vagueness which was taken which could be taken advantage of on by either side. No one expected in 1971 that Siachen Glacier would also become a battleground. That is why it was left at that. Now, when the Indian side moved in, the Pakistanis realized that the Indians are moving. They also moved in fast. It was ni- the Indian side had not prepared themselves very well to that extent uh, to the extent of mountaineering equipment etc. We moved in with uh, very little of uh, you know extra clothing that is required for glaciated regions. There were a lot of casualties, but uh, finally India was able to capture the heights which dominate the Siachen Glacier. From the Pakistan side, uh, also they moved in, but uh, the advantage clearly remained with the Indian Army and in Siachen, and it has remained such till date. There have been efforts after that to de 
and the you know to create a peace uh, situation in siachen but uh, that has not been successful during mon singh era also there were talks that siachen glacier uh, should not we should not be fighting a searching glacier should not be a battleground but uh, no one could uh, reach any final settlement from the pakistan side they have been trying to legitimize their hold on siachen glacier and uh, therefore for to that extent they have been uh, promoting international tourism including skiing etc in the higher regions in up to the area where there is you know where people are safe as far as the battleground is concerned and these uh, uh, expeditions tourism expeditions had been on for quite some years before 1984 too yeah got it makes sense so uh, is it also true that uh, so they had some access to the to the siachen glacier but not to complete ac- ac- access to it prior to 1984 they had some uh, tourism activities that were happening also they were vacating that area as soon as the winters came in right that was the whole concept that we went in when the area was vacated and then we just captured the whole thing and then we just never left that was the yeah one of yeah. the concepts and the flip side to to this was uh, that the pakistan side they the planners they tried to do the same thing in in kargil in 1999 where we captured the 1999 and uh, the kargil heights in the summers but it was too cold it was too the terrain was too too difficult i would imagine that uh, we vacated that dur- during the winters ec- not anticipating that it could be captured so the pakistani side they did the flip side they did the other side where they captured it uh, during the winters and then when our soldiers went up our, the posts were already captured and then we had to fi- uh, fight that conflict to get them out of those posts that was in 1999 kargil 1999 1999 now in the uh, along the line of control when the line of control is clearly defined there has been a procedure that the indian army has been following for decades and that uh, procedure is that uh, there are some posts which which are called winter vacated posts those posts are in the higher regions these posts are vacated during the winters because uh, the uh, snow conditions and all do not permit uh, movement etc in those areas and therefore the threat is not perceived the the there is uh, helicopter reconnaissance sorties continuously monitor these areas that there is no movement from the other side these helicopter reconnaissance sorties do the job of uh, uh, ensuring that there is no movement on the other side they if they notice any movement immediately the indian army gets into action mode this is the activity which has been followed and the same activity was been followed in 1998 99 also but during the winter of 1998 99 the pakistan army quietly moved in their soldiers in those areas where the winter vacated posts were there in the kargil sector in kargil sector the pakistan army is you know can oversee the leh shrinagar highway and they wanted to their aim was to ensure that they are able to effectively control leh shrinagar highway to a large extent so to that extent they wanted to occupy these uh, heights along the leh shrinagar axis in kargil mm-hmm. and cut off ladakh this winter movement uh, was uh, you know sort of uh, there was a there could be a lack of helicopter reconnaissance sorties due to bad weather etc whatever the reasons but they were somewhat undetected for quite some time the pakistani uh, forces were able to form in in those heights before the indian army realized and when the indian army suffered casualties they realized that the pakistanis have moved in thereafter there was this famous kargil war in 1999 in which uh, the nawaz sharif government which was in power at that time in pakistan they had to relent and give in to indian demands the, the prime minister of pakistan nawaz sharif on a visit to usa Uh, in a meeting with in the press conference with bill clinton had to openly say that we will withdraw our forces from that kargil area but uh, ironically 
the Pakistan army did not recognize that these people were their soldiers. They said they are mercenaries. They are not our soldiers. They did not uh, recognize those soldiers till the end. In one case, there, there, have, there were cases where the Indian army, you know, gave respect to the uh, uh, Pakistan army soldiers who had died during the gunfight, yeah. uh, during the battle like a soldier gives to another soldier who has died and that finally it was after a long uh, after a long time the pakistan army admitted that these people were their own and there was basically the northern light infantry that was used for this purpose this was the uh, this was under parvez musharraf yeah. and uh, the relations between parvez musharraf and nawaz sharif started to sort during this period yeah this was uh, like when this when I mean, an incident like this happens, uh, it doesn't matter what side you are on, where your soldiers have come, you know, they've, they've, they're, they're fighting from your side. So they deserve the respect of your side and the other side as well after they've, they've fallen. So not uh, not uh, identifying them or not, not claiming them as their own, own soldiers and calling them mercenaries, I think was one of the shameful in incidents by the Pakistani uh, military establishment at that time, how it would have a huge uh, impact on the morale of the troops as well, right? If uh, some of their fallen fallen soldiers are not even being credited for being soldiers of the Pakistani army and just being called as mujahids or mercenaries, it's a very it sort of like gives them a, a puts them at a very lower level compared to a regular uh, armed forces person. Now you are talking from the you know the way you understand the Indian Army. The Pakistan right. Army system is slightly different, though they are uh, they have come out from the same place. They they were together once, but the Pakistan Army has been following the system of sending their uh, army personnel as mujahids to fight in Afghanistan, to fight elsewhere, to fight in Kashmir also in disguise. 1947 onwards, so this culture has always been there with them, and they recognize them discreetly, not openly. The Pakistan Army recognizes them. It can't happen that the Pakistan Army does not recognize them, but they recognize them internally, discreetly, not in the open, not openly. Otherwise, uh, like you said, things would not be, you know, very honky dory for the Pakistan Army. But uh, this public, uh, you know, non recognition is not a very good, uh, you know, not a very good thing for the for any army to do. If the army men have been seen there, spotted there, well, they should be sooner or later, they should be recognized, which the Pakistan army did at a later date. Now, coming to the, can I, uh, okay, sorry, yeah. You no, no, go ahead. I was, no, I was just uh, accepting the fact, yes, it would not publicly uh, acknowledging what they have done for their country. I think that would, that is a huge, uh, it, it would impact the morale of the troops for sure. Uh, I don't agree with this. The morale of the troops, in they are used to, the troops there also are psychologically trained that way that some people will go into fighting as Mujahids. And they are the part of the Islamized uh, army. This is uh, the Islamic culture which is, uh, which is drilled into some people. So they go as uh, part of the Islamic uh, army, so to say. Okay. which was uh, which happened during Zia ul Haq time actually the pakistan army was islamized to a, to some extent by under Zia ul Haq Zia ul Haq was himself a slightly conservative person and uh, he brought in islamization in the pakistan army he brought in uh, at the political level also islamization process he started in the in pakistan re removing pakistan away from the secularism or sort of some to some extent secular system in Pakistan. Gradually he moved to an Islamic system being put in place. Can I, can I cover the political setup from 1988 when Zia was you know, brought down? Zia's plane was brought down I think on 17th of August 1988. The, uh, your American ambassador was also in the same uh, plane which came down from when they flew from Bahawalpur. The next army chief took over and elections were held after that. 
by about uh, say December, November, October to December, sometime the elections were held. In do you think this was a? Do you think this was a natural accident, be- or was there some shady business going on over there? Because the American diplomat also was in that plane, so it seems like unlikely that there was something shady going on in that scenario. Is there no, any there conspiracy was, theories on that? I I personally feel there was uh, uh, shady activity going on. It was not clean. There was some, you know, sabotage activity for sure. It was not possible uh, for the plane to disintegrate in the air like that. Okay. And uh, uh, like uh, the CIA is quite active in Pakistan. If there was some other intelligence agency that was involved in this, that intelligence agency, the CIA would have brought it up. But the inquiry was also, you know, suppressed sort of. The inquiry was not allowed to be. Uh, taken to its logical conclusions. Therefore, one can surmise that there was some American hand, to some extent at least, or maybe a Pakistani hand in collusion with America. Okay. Yeah. After that, uh, the 1988 elections, the uh, political situation was slightly turbulent. Benazir Bhutto came to power in 1988 elections but she was not able to hold on to power so for so long there was there was discontent in the uh, population the uh, corruption scandals within the benazi government were also not you no know, taken very were also a pointer to bad you know governance Benazir was not able to continue for so long, uh, for long, and the president removed her in 1991 or so. 1990, then elections were held in 1991. Nawaz Sharif, who was a protege of uh, Zia ul Haq, he had been picked up by Zia ul Haq from a small timer politician to a big time politician as uh, the head of the Muslim League. He came to power, he became the prime minister. But he also could not get along with the president. They had a clash, the president and the prime minister. And his government also was brought down in 1993 or so. There was no, like this phase continued. Uh, once Benazir was, uh, came to power, she was, uh, she was removed. Then Nawaz Sharif came to power. He was removed after two, three, uh, after three years or so. Then again, elections were held. Benazir again came to power. So this activity continued in 1998. Uh, Nawaz Sharif was back in power during the Kargil crisis. But after the Kargil crisis, uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, wanted to remove uh, Parvez, Musharraf. His name? Parvez Musharraf. Before this, Nawaz Sharif had already, during Nawaz Sharif's tenure, one army chief, Asif Nawaz Janjua, mm-hmm. had died while uh, in service as the army chief which was, uh, again, which uh, there was some sort of suspicion that he was poisoned. Even today, also, people talk of Janjua being poisoned by the elements who wanted to remove him. Because Janjua was straight, and he was... He was a professional wanted, soldier. Professional soldier, and he wanted things to be sorted out, not the, the political murkiness that was going on in Pakistan. He wanted things to be cleaned up. He was... Uh, uh, when he died, he was uh, Jang Karamat took over, Jangir Karamat took over, but Jangir Karamat also could not pull along well with the uh, with the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, and Jangir Karamat Karamat was also removed, uh, was also forced to resign, sort of, uh, before his tenure ended. Parvez Musharraf was then put in place. Uh, Nawaz Sharif thought that Parvez Musharraf, being a Muhajir, he would be he would. Uh, you know, be more suitable, more pliable, I would say, as the army chief. And uh, Nawaz Sharif could play his cards well. But uh, the army establishment, if one talks of it, the uh, Pakistan army establishment itself is uh, not, uh, was at that time at least, was not a single man establishment. Under the Aul Haq, the ISI had expanded to a large extent. And the Aulak had, uh, you know, started this uh, giving largess to generals, giving them free plots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, the generals were taking advantage of this largess. They were being put in places of uh, power in the civil governance after retirement, also during service, also 
so the army was used to governing the country now and uh, the it was uh, like i would call it uh, that the pakistan army was functioning like a multinational company where the board of directors the lieutenant generals the yeah. major players would yeah. uh, control would discuss the issues and would collectively decide what is to be done this is how parvez musharraf was work, uh, was also working and when parvez musharraf during a sri lanka visit was removed by nawaz sharif when he was his plane was in the air from sri lanka to uh, karachi he was removed from the position and uh, another general ziauddin i think was put in place the army uh, generalship all core commanders got together and they decided that enough was enough they uh, sent in uh, troops to arrest nawaz sharif to uh, keep him under house arrest in his uh, room and uh, they uh, as soon as uh, the clearance was given to pervez musharraf that the airport in karachi is clear he landed the core commander was there to receive him and uh, then pervez musharraf took over the uh, power as the chief marshal law administrator there's a in, there's a chief executive story. sorry chief executive chief yes he's, he's the ceo chief he was the CEO, CEO of the, the <laughs> so of the they made they made the uh, state of Pakistan as a multinational company and he became the CEO, CEO. with a with the president continuing with no pass to with him. CEO was uh, amassed with all the pass. Yeah. No, I, I was I was just saying that there's an interesting story around this where Pervez Musharraf and he was flying back from Sri Lanka to Karachi, I think. Uh, his plane was in the air and he was not sure whether you know if he lands whether he'll be uh, will be put under arrest or what would happen to him. He was not sure that whether uh, the airport was secured by his people or not. So he got in touch with someone from the airport authority to uh, someone that he spoke about, but he wanted to make sure that it is the person that he's speaking to. So he asked him, what is the name of my dog? And then when he answered the right question, then like, okay, he's my guy. And we got a, uh, we, the airport is secured and that's when he landed. And that's when the whole thing yeah. happened, right? It's such yeah, that's how story. that's how these uh, you know I would call Pakistan a banana republic. Though it was at that time still not fully a banana republic. Today it mm -hmm. is uh, in the category of a banana republic. They all banana republics work like this. They don't. The trust de deficit is always there between everyone. Right. So this is how Nawaz Sharif was uh, then uh, tried for uh, treason, and he was sentenced to ten years in jail. But Saudi Arabia moved in. Saudi Arabia then said that, no, don't put him in prison, send him out. He was uh, sent out to Saudi Arabia to stay outside the country. And the agreement was signed between Parvez Musharraf and uh, them that uh, for 10 years, the uh, this man, Nawaz Sharif, would stay out of the country. He will not be harmed. And uh, that is how Nawaz Sharif was able to then get out safely from Pakistan. Yeah, because Parvez Musharraf was... then continued as the chief executive. Yeah, no, I was I was just saying he was probably concerned uh, that uh, uh, what happened to Zulfikar Ibuto. Yeah, that's that's what would end up happening to him. So yeah. uh, he probably should have some options out there. Nawaz Sharif, during his tenures as prime minister, had uh, established uh, some good relations with. Uh, uh, he had made some good friends in america in saudi arabia as well as uh, both the countries and uh, also obviously cia so these people were always there to help out to bail out nawaz sharif whenever he got into problems this is where 1999 and uh, then uh, uh, parvez musharraf was uh, ruling he did not allow political activities he also got into you know that there should be non-political non -political elections and all, no political parties, etc. But uh, he, the, his uh, activities, political or socio-political activities were soon overtaken by the 9-11 incident that uh, occurred, where the Al-Qaeda attacked, uh, destroyed some, uh, de destroyed the yeah, twin towers, twin towers and in America. And Al-Qaeda then was the, became the main target of uh, which was already the main target, but then Al-Qaeda now had to be done away with, and uh, Osama bin Laden also had to be finished. 
this was uh, they forced uh, america forced uh, parvez musharraf to agree to american terms and the americans then entered afghanistan through northern alliance the northern alliance under uh, masood was uh, already active in northern areas of afghanistan now to look at afghanistan uh, the southern part of afghanistan is uh, uh, south afghanistan that is major part of afghanistan is uh, uh, pathan dominated but northern side has got tajiks and uzbeks right so those uh, ethnically they are different people hazaras on one side are uh, also there on the iran on the iran border side so ethnically these people have always been uh, different and they have been treated differently by the uh, pashtun uh, uh, ruling elite that has been controlling afghanistan yeah this is uh, this is what is this, this is 2001 then this parvez uh, musharraf continued uh, in power but uh, by this time parvez musharraf was forced to commit himself to not allow pakistan territory to be used for any terrorism activities against any country which in a way was admission of the fact that pakistan was using its territory for carrying out terrorist activities in india and in kashmir right so the, india has always been taking advantage of this obviously india would take advantage of this and india had been maintaining good relations with america and there was slight amount of you know in pakistan it is uh, suspected that the indian hand was behind this uh, uh, has always been behind the american policies in pakistan to force uh, pakistan to not attack uh, uh, not carry out any anti india activities yeah i mean but they have been doing a lot of yeah. anti india activities i mean they 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 did curb down on the terrorist organizations that were against the west but uh, a lot of the aid that they got from the west was then uh, funneled to a lot of the organizations that were doing terrorist activities against india in 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 kashmir so even though they accepted the fact that oh their their uh, territory will not be used for any of those activities but they are still doing it and they in from 2001 to 2010 also which includes the 2611 attacks as well right yeah they have been doing it and they will continue to do it that is you know certain uh, level i would say that the americans cannot 100% control what happens in pakistan uh, behind the scenes in pakistan but the admission at the highest level of this fact was itself very a clear indicator that uh, pakistan was admitting that it had been using terrorist uh, terrorists uh, trained and organized by the pakistan army for use in kashmir when the afghan problem when afghanistan was taken over by you know was uh, run over by american forces and america put in place uh, and a regime of its own liking Uh, removing the taliban from there by the way this taliban also was uh, actively trained by pakistan army the home minister during uh, benazir bhutto's government nasrul da babar mm-hmm. retired major he took the he personally organized this taliban movement and uh, they said that we are not happy with the present you know terrorist groups operating present various groups operating within afghanistan and they wanted a pro pakistan regime to be placed to be placed in afghanistan this had been happening since the old haq time they had been making efforts to ensure that afghanistan sort of remained uh, you know a state of sort of became a state of pakistan and which would give afghanistan which would give pakistan strategic depth too they were talking of strategic depth by you know getting afghanistan totally on their side can you so, uh, ex- explain yeah. the concept of strategic depth strategic depth is that uh, when you look at the pakistan map on the north the uh, northwest frontier province now pakhtunkhwa that is uh, khyber pakhtunkhwa that is uh, area is not it does not have much of depth okay and uh, pakistan region can be run over very fast so pakistan forces if they have to withdraw then there is not much of uh, strategic depth uh, to which they can go by having afghanistan 
they have adequate stretched depth where they can operate from Afghanistan bases and their terrorist activities also can take place from there. Uh, that gives them a lot of advantage as far as maneuverability is concerned in air as well as on ground. Yeah. So in a in a in a scenario if uh, where the Indian military it sort of uh, does an engagement or does a campaign uh, along the along its western border uh, towards the eastern side into Pakistan and they the Pakistani military ends up losing a lot, their point is that okay we our forces can retreat well within the territory of Afghanistan and operate out of there and then sort of uh, rebuild their military and then attack back? Is that the whole idea that behind is one, it? That is one way, but that is uh, not, uh, uh, no, that scenario is not being thought of at present because the, frankly speaking, the Indian army does not have, also does not have that much of capability to go that much deep into. But then uh, what happens is that uh, the bases available within Afghanistan, the air bases and the uh, availability of terrain also, uh, the difficult terrain there, allows Pakistan uh, uh, to keep their assets safely in that area and from there launch attacks. So it gives them that much of strategic depth because the, uh, the reach of the Indian Air Force also will be that much less in those in, in deeper. Right. That was their objective, right? So yeah. if they have Afghanistan with where it is very, very pro-Pakistan, a government yeah. in Afghanistan, so they'll be willing to have a lot of so key assets. Where, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Continue. No, I was just saying that uh, all of this re re relies on the assumption that the Afghanistan government is extremely pro-Pakistan. And it's actually acting as like a vessel Vessel state is 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 that a vessel good... state? Yeah, something right. like a vessel state. Yeah, but that's not, not happening right now. That's that actually that right. that situation is now passe. It is no more uh, in uh, contention anymore. Even the Taliban is now uh, against uh, Pakistan army. Now to touch upon this subject, recently there was a press conference by uh, the Pakistan one of the uh, higher figures in uh, in Taliban in Afghanistan in the government. He said very plainly, he said that the, we cannot rely on Pakistan army. He said Pakistan army does what it suits them. When it suited them, they created, they helped the Taliban to gain Afghanistan. And because they wanted Afghanistan to be their vessel state, sort of vessel state, like we discussed. But after that, when the Americans put pressure on them, they, uh, uh, they surrendered, they gave up a lot of, you know, Taliban activists, Taliban leaders to America. They, yeah, uh, so they gave in to American demands. So, so this was the double game that they were playing, right? In the yeah, 90s, yeah. they so were... The reliability, reliability of Pakistan army in terms of, uh, in the eyes of the Taliban and in the eyes of other Afghan elements has been now very low. That is why the Taliban is now said that no, we will not, we do not, we do not rely on you. And we, the Taliban has uh, sort of created their the uh, adjunct in Pakistan. That is the uh, TTP, Tariqe oh. Taliban Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. Let's so that let's is, take that, that is their adjunct. Yeah. Let's uh, let's take a step back. So uh, yeah. we had we'll we go back from to Pakistan. 2001 to 2010, uh, yeah. Pervez Musharraf was there. Uh, then he ended up joining politics. So I think General Kiani became the, the, army, chief chief. Army, the, uh, yeah. the army chief and then General Bajwa after him. And with, then he got a couple of extensions. Yeah. Uh, staying on the uh, subject of Pakistan. Uh, so now Bajwa is also gone. And now there's a, the uh, Gen General Asif Munir. Is he the General leader? Asif Munir, yeah, Sayyid Asif Munir has taken over as the army chief. How now, would you, uh, yeah, yeah, so the uh, question that I wanted to get at was how would you rate uh, General Kiani, Bajwa, Asif Munir in terms of effectiveness uh, towards their objective uh, or like how pro, in, how anti India, like on, on a scale of one to ten, who's 
more anti india and who is more sort of moderate on that issue how would you categorize those people firstly what is the uh, no i'll uh, this various parts uh, firstly is asif munir jal asif munir how he was selected itself uh, was uh, he is from his background is from ots officer training school which is now closed and most of the uh, other generals are from the pma pakistan military academy and majority of the officers the pakistan army is officered major in a majority by the pma officers so that was uh, when uh, nawaz sharif uh, put his foot down that he will not give extending any more extension to bajwa in uh, november 2022 2022 asif munir was the senior most person but bajwa was to retire on october 20 november 29th and uh, Asif Munir was retiring on November 27th. He had to be given a two days extension. Extension in a way that there, are, there is a post vacant of the Vice Chief of Army Staff. That's a four-star general post in Pakistan Army. There were at that time two four-star generals. One is the Chairman Joint Chief of Staff and the Army Chief. But there was this post vacant. And he was, uh, for two days, he was held in that on that post. And... On October 20, on November 29th, <clears throat> he took over as the army chief from Jalan Bajwa. Jalan Bajwa tried his best to ensure that uh, Asif Munir does not take over the reins of the Pakistan army. Why? There were various reasons. There were various, various reasons for that. Asif Munir was not part of the coterie which uh, worked under Bajwa. he had always uh, remained his own man sort of you know he had distant he did not get uh, was not very close to bajwa bajwa's kotri was most of the other core commanders they were part of the bajwa kotri and uh, the senior most six generals out of them he wanted anyone else except for asif munir and asif munir was retiring two days prior so he said comfortably that any of the other other persons other four five can be made the army chief one of them was faiz amid who was number four and uh, faiz amid also had a controversy he was the chief of isi he in the political circles he was uh, pinned to be close to imran khan and he was uh, sort of advising imran khan that is what the opposition said so he was also ruled out he also said that i am not in the reckoning but then finally nawaz sharif decided on asif munir nawaz sharif said very plainly out of his experience years he had uh, he has appointed five army chiefs nawaz, nawaz sharif, sharif how how is he in the picture in this nawaz sharif is the main uh, person behind shahbaz sharif nawaz sharif is right. the exiled in pakistan but uh, shahbaz sharif cannot work cannot do anything without consultations with nawaz and nawaz right. uh, controls the government from london while sitting in london so nawaz sharif said that ki kisi nu laga lo inna nu inna ne jana utthe hi hai meaning that mm-hmm. you put any army chief he will work for the interest of the army only so he said let us put the senior most person because he realized that uh, there were two things going in favor of uh, putting asif munir there one was that asif munir was dg uh, isi and he was uh, posted out uh, from that appointment after about 9 months of tenure which was slightly uh, which was not in the common practice and it is it was said that uh, he was uh, he was taken out of dgs isi appointment at the behest of uh, imran khan when he was the prime minister that is the time the and faiz amit took over as dgs isi from him so faiz so faiz amit this one was amit okay sorry sorry, sorry. one was this and the second is that uh, he was not part of the you know pma group so he was sort of separate he said that uh, he is not part of the bajwa setup so therefore let us put uh, uh, asif munir nawaz sharif decided in the pakistan nawaz sharif decided that asif munir will be will become the army chief in spite of all the resistance he ensured that asif munir came into power came became the army chief yeah He's saying something he- PMA as in uh, Pakistani Military Academy, like we have our yeah. IMA. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Faiz Ahmed was the Imran Khan guy, and Asif Munir is 
he's just his own guy he's not a part of any mm-hmm. specific he's not mm-hmm. yeah no 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 one's guy he's like no one's favorite he's just an army but chief, then so. he has been he has been appointed by nawaz sharif so people say that there has been a, uh, there have been some promises that he has made to nawaz sharif this is what people say but i doubt it the uh, i mean i doubt it he would have he would not be anyone's man in times to come one i am sure one will realize that asif munir is nobody's man he is his own man this is what i feel okay now talking about uh, bajwa and prior to that there is a the pakistan army the isi i'll talk of isi first. can i uh, continue yeah can yes, i continue on this yeah. yes yeah okay isi isi has uh, organs about 14 15 uh, you know departments isi has under it and uh, one of them is the internal security department that department is headed by major major nasir is heading at that at this time this looks after the internal political scenario in pakistan this is uh, this uh, they have got sector commanders as brigadiers in all these states in lahore there is one sindh karachi there is one like in islamabad there is one like that all headed by all brigadiers they are sector commanders and under them there are there are directors and deputy directors etc these people control the reins of the civil governance civil government they have control over everyone and uh, isi has been playing a very dirty game for quite some time now isi is into phone tapping into video making of all political leaders and all possible you know people who can tomorrow be a threat to the hegemony of pakistan army that it that it enjoys in pakistan so so they can so be they blackmailed control, and then they, yeah. they control the political setup through phone uh, through phone uh, you know audio and video recordings and through files that they have made of corruption scandals of uh, all these people 2013 elections uh, nawaz sharif came to power in army in Uh, pakistan it is well known that uh, the no government can come to power without the help of the pakistan army the internal wing of isi does that job it ensures that the elections are adequately rigged and uh, the party which they want to win which they want to come to power that party is allowed to come to power but with the mandate that they cannot control everything they will not they don't permit a huge mandate two thirds mandate or three fourths mandate or something like that they permit a mandate in which they are just able to manage their you know scrounge through their time and they cannot do much they if they if uh, nawaz sharif like if he had two thirds majority he would uh, bring army under uh, proper control that the um, pakistan army is not allowing any more they ensured that there is a tight political control over the state they have a, another wing in isi which is called the media wing now media wing controls all the media personalities what is we talked of in media what is not to be talked of in media and they feed the media their land reports they have their you know these uh, in pakistan they call them lifafa uh, press persons they call them lifafas lifafas means that they are giving a, they, they are giving annual, given envelopes with notes with money and oh. they uh, uh, go ahead with the reports that were that are given by the isi to talk of in uh, on all the television channels as well as their own personal all the all the media men in the newspapers too so lifafa safis they call them these people are doing the job what the isi wants them to do this is how the isi wields power and through isi the army chief wields power technically the isi head comes under the prime minister the army chief cannot remove it and he cannot you know uh, he, he, he the isi chief does not come under the army chief but the army chief controls it seems like the isi yeah. is like in like in the us they have the cia which takes care of operations outside of the us territory 
and they have the FBI, which takes care of all the in investigations with, within the US territory, also sometimes outside also. But it seems like ISI is an, an all encompassing organization which takes, which handles the internal as well as external investigation the threats. ISI, ISI handles both internal and external, and they have taken what you Over said about from CIA, yeah. what they wanted to take. But in addition, mm -hmm. they have added their own stuff, and that is that they control the they control the entire state. They control the bureaucrats by making by keeping files on those bureaucrats, and they use those files, those audio video leaks, as for their convenience. Mm -hmm. Now, in two zero one three to two zero one eight, Nawaz Sharif remained in power, but Nawaz Sharif uh, didn't Imran did, Khan win. Imran Khan came to power in two zero one eight. Oh, okay. Okay. The 2018 elections, Imran Khan came to power, and when Imran Khan came to power, the uh, uh, PMLN, that is the Nawaz Sharif Party, PMLN, they said that uh, Nawa, uh, Imran Khan is the uh, picked up boy. Selected, from, selected, selected candidate. Selected yeah. candidate he's not from, elected, he's selected. He's not the selected candidate from yeah. by the Pakistan army. And ISI has put him in place. But uh, Imran Khan continuously said that, no, I was winning more 20 to 25 seats, more which I was denied. The total majority figure in uh, Pakistan parliamentary is at 172. Imran Khan was not allowed to go beyond 153. So he had to make a government with the help of smaller outfits. Right. Like there is one Bab party in Balochistan. There is this... Uh, a party from ANP from uh, and uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So it's, the it's the same parties, concept. MQM, MQM. It is the same also. concept, though. Same it, is, concept. It, it is the same concept that we will not let anyone come yeah. become too too powerful and get too much of a majority, like two thirds of majority, yeah. so that yeah. as and when needed, uh, we could topple that that guy or topple that government and yeah. keep a relatively unstable and less powerful political setup. Yeah. Now, when uh, Imran Khan took over, the economy was in shambles. The uh, economic state was uh, the uh, was totally in disarray. There was total corruption during Nawaz Sharif tenure and uh, balance of his tenure when he was uh, no uh, during Nawaz Sharif tenure till two zero one eight and uh, if, thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. If if over here, if if you could sort of give an overview of the overall political landscape like these are the major parties like in the okay. 90s it seemed like it was a two party system between the bhuttos and nawaz sharif but then imran khan comes in now in in 28 if you could just give an overall political landscape okay. Okay. keeping the army aside which which all, which is always there and that interference will always yeah. be there from the side the uh, no imran khan Step has about 26 27 years now of political history. He joined politics in 1995, I think, and uh, since then, Imran Khan uh, remained separate from the others. The two other players were the Bhutto family, Bhutto Zardari family, one side, and uh, Sharif family on the other side. Nawaz Sharif's uh, party has been PMLN and PML and PML uh, Pakistan Muslim League Noon, they call it. And uh, the uh, Pakistan People's Party is the party of Zadari and Bhutto, Zadari Bhutto family. Mm -hmm. These two people have been alternating as prime ministers. These two families have been alternating as prime minister, president, etc., from uh, right from 1988 till say about uh, 2018, I would say. Okay. Till that time, these two families. But then gradually, Imran Khan was emerging as a force to reckon with. In uh, even in uh, 2013, he won quite a few seats and he said that he was denied a number of seats which he could have won otherwise there is a difference between the uh, political you know functioning of Imran Khan and the other parties there are before that there are smaller parties like the MQM MQM is a Karachi Hyderabad based Sindh Karachi Hyderabad based party urban based party of the Muhajirs, Muhajirs are the people who migrated from India during partition. Hmm. The of the basically the Muhajirs to look after the Muhajirs' interests. And uh, Mia Altaf was their head, who was exiled uh, during Zia's time 
he is still stays in London. He has not been allowed to return to Pakistan. There is a uh, national party in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which has uh, over a period of time now has lost the relevance that it had during the time of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan and his son. But uh, it still remains to some extent a bit of relevance. Uh, it uh, retains a bit of relevance. Baltistan has no, you know, nothing of, uh, not much of political activity because uh, the uh, all the parties which are there, they are uh, there till the time the army is happy with them. So the Baap party which has been created there, Baltistan Awami party, that is also a creation of the Pakistan army. Whenever the, whosoever the Pakistan army wants to bring up, they create their party in Baltistan. As far as Punjab is concerned, Punjab was a stronghold or is a strong was till recently a stronghold of PMLN, that is uh, Nawaz Sharif's party. Oh, sure. yeah. <clears throat> Sindh, the <clears throat> Zardari Bhutto family has been uh, has claimed uh, that Sindh is their stronghold, and PPP at one time had uh, uh, established their government in the state of Punjab also, but Punjab by and large remained a. PMLN party, the PMLN state, okay. till recently. Now, the uh, Pakistan army created a PMLN Q, PMLN CAF, to bring down to, uh, you know, bring down uh, Nawaz Sharif, who was becoming a bit too strong, and uh, that party also remained. Uh, they had Sujat Chaudhary was their prime minister for some time, but then PMLNQ was totally a uh, Pakistan army created party, and it was not able to gain much of strength. Till, is, it, yes. is it fair to is it fair to say that it is the uh, the the three parties that are the all the big ones and these like there there are a bunch of small players that are out there can that can be used. Their alliances can be bought whenever yeah, it's needed, yeah. but it's the three major ones that are currently op operating now, although the two other parties that was a part of the two party systems, they have formed a coalition. The current no. coalition is basically a Zardari Sharif coalition. Yeah, I'm. it is not only that, there is another party, religious party of uh, Jamaat al Islam, mm -hmm. JUI, of uh, Fazlur Rahman, Mulana Fazlur Rahman, that is the, that is NWFP, that is Khyber Bakhtar based, that is also part of this alliance. Mm -hmm. The uh, 2018 elections uh, the all the 13 uh, the nawaz sharif ppp pmln ppp and all uh, this uh, jui and all the others they got together and they formed an alliance after 2018 which is a 13 party alliance this was alliance was cobbled up later on though in 2021 this is a 13 party alliance all the political parties except for imran khan's party are in this group of 13 parties this is the weirdest thing ever like they the, pakistan had a basically had two major parties the nawaz sharif and uh, zardari bhuttos it's like the bjp and congress over here in india yeah it's yeah. it's sort of weird like it's it's kind of similar to bjp and congress forming a coalition government <laughs> and then yeah, they, it's the weirdest they formed, thing because they yeah, in fact in between uh, zardari became prime minister after forming a coalition with Nawaz Sharif, but it did not uh, uh, take too long for both to split with each other. They have been working in collusion with each other and in collision with each other, both ways. Okay, so collusion they have, as well as collision. They, they have, have a like history that. of cooperation as well. It's history not like of, the BJP and Congress. Mostly, completely... mostly history of uh, uh, fighting, fight for interest, for their own interest, but mm -hmm. there have been cooperation in between, in mm -hmm. Punjab also and in at the center also. Okay, for some time. So now, now we have the, the sorry. There is one point which I want to bring out that Imran Khan's party is a bit different from the other parties. Imran Khan has right from 1995. He, he is to first we look at Imran Khan's you know character. He has been a star before he became he joined the politics. He is well known in international circles as a famous cricketer. He won the World Cup for Pakistan. With Pakistan won in 1992, I think. He won the World Cup for them. This is credit goes to him because his leadership. 
he is a charismatic person there is no doubt in that he has been heavy, he has had a western uh, kind of lifestyle i would put it that way and he has when he created his political party he ensured that he created the political party in a manner and he started it in a manner he has been uh, organizing it in in a manner that uh, there are no scandals that can come up in his party the funds which come to him are all legal he takes them through accounts and uh, he has ensured that uh, the accounts and all are well maintained he has stayed away from any corruption scandals himself people have tried their best to pin him down in some corruption scandal or the other some scandal or the other but he has stayed away from all these scandals for 26 years of his public life i would say before that it was not public life per se before that he was a different person but after uh, joining politics he has stayed away from any you know mockery of a political system any corruption scandals he has promised good governance to the people on the other side the other parties the other two main contenders pmln and uh, ppp they are known corrupt people they are known to be totally corrupt Zardari is known as Mr. 10% and Mr. Nawaz Sharif and Shabaz Sharif are known to be uh, garnering every any penny which comes, gar garnering it for themselves. So that is the basic stark difference between the two sides. Yeah. Okay, so where, this does, is where does the TTP? So we, we've been hearing a lot about the uh, we'll, Taliban, we'll Pakistan. Talk. Can okay, we okay. leave, keep TTP for a while aside? Right. We'll come to Nawaz. Uh, we'll come to Baju first. Okay. Baju was picked up. Uh, he was, I think, fifth or sixth in the hierarchy. Was picked up by Nawaz Sharif. To yeah, if you, if you could just yeah, if you could just briefly go over Baju yeah. and and Bajwa. Kayani. I wanted to sort of go over. Kayani the... was before him for six years. Kayani uh, was three years and three years extension. Then Kayani went to Saudi Arabia as the you know military advisor, sort of with Saudi Arabian government. Mm -hmm. Kani himself, uh, he may have been involved in scandals, etc., but he never uh, was uh, publicly there. His name has never been smeared. Bajwa, first three years were good, everybody was happy with him, and his conduct was also reasonably good from 2017 till 2020. Then the, he wanted uh, extension. Now, this extension was slightly murky. Now, recently, after Bajwa's retirement, now, after three years' extension, he has retired in November 29th of 2022. He, the details of this uh, murky, uh, you know, uh, extension of three years has been, have been coming up. Now, it is said that uh, Bajwa sort of, you know, put that fear of, uh, that uh, Imran Khan's party will be removed from governance if Imran Khan does not give him extension. Yeah, and cool. he's, no, no, he, uh, the, uh, he, they would just tell the Ba party, MQM party, and the ANP to stay to get away. And right. as soon as they got away, uh, to remove their support. Imran, Imran Khan would lose uh, majority support. He was right. above 172, he would come to 153. Right. So that was very simple for uh, they had to just give an order to MQM and uh, BAP and ANP to withdraw. Yeah. One sentence and they would withdraw. They were creators. They, these parties are at the behest of uh, working under full control of the Pakistan Army. Okay. Now, they, it is said that uh, DGISI at that time, Faiz Amit and uh, one more general, I think it was uh, DGISPR, they both went to... Uh, Imran Khan and made him uh, got the signature of him uh, giving three years extension to recommending three years extension to Bajwa on a blank piece of paper. Okay, this is not the way the system works. The if the uh, extension is to be given, the file has to move from the Ministry of Defence from the Defence Secretary's table. It has to go to the Prime Minister, then to the President to give assent. In this case, there was no file which was moved. It was just that he was forced, that fear was put into uh, Imran Khan that he would be removed from the chair 
and at that time imran khan uh, was making good progress as a prime minister he did not want to now get away because the results of his uh, positive administration is good administration were now being visible to the public and uh, he bajwa took the extension from the government he did not have to take the help of the opposition also but bajwa ensured that nawaz sharif also agreed in public nawaz sharif and pmln to say that yes we agree to bajwa should be given his extension whatever was being demanded so he got extension uh, of his tenure from the uh, government as well as the opposition which is a very strange case he did not need this uh, nawaz sharif uh, to say yes to it but now things are emerging that bajwa was in were colluding with nawaz sharif from the right from the beginning they were working hand in glove sort of he had they had already decided in about 20 that uh, uh, 2019 end that uh, imran khan is to be removed but then 2020 uh, this uh, covid took over and uh, after that they had to continue with imran khan as the prime minister then uh, they gradually they get to work together nawaz sharif and ppp were made to get together to sit together and uh, by the pakistan army by bajwa and uh, they uh, formed this this 13 party alliance was created this alliance then uh, in uh, they moved a vote of no confidence on 8th of march 22 against the imran khan government there was a lot yeah. of you know yeah yeah here here in this case pakistan uh, uh, then prime minister imran khan he was talking about foreign collusion the, the, yeah. there was a foreign hand and in him being ousted and his government falling and the reason that he gave was that he wanted a uh, a more independent foreign policy or more in independent policy for 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 pakistan and they will like just like what india does where if we get a good deal over here we will act in our own interest and we will not just be on one side and act in the interest of the united states or the western alliance and he said that that was the reason why his government uh, was made to fall or why, why he was ousted how how credible is this accusation no this there are certain facts there are certain uh, there's certain amount of truth i would say and uh, the fact is that uh, when director cia was visiting pakistan in 2021 uh, imran khan should have met him logically because imran khan needed to you know after uh, biden took over Imran Khan had good relations with Trump, but then after Biden took over, Imran Khan was uh, not having good terms with uh, Biden. And it is a known fact that Biden was working as per the uh, you know desires of the establishment, American establishment, whereas Trump was uh, sort of anti-establishment, I would say. So Imran Khan needed to build bridges, and he needed to meet people, and he needed to convey his point of view. he refused to meet with the cia director uh, one doesn't know for what reason but then that gave a total leeway to bajwa to deal with the cia and with the american people with the american government okay that was actually a mistake by imran khan which he i am sure must be admitting that he should have continued he should have met uh, cia director another thing is that uh, the uh, Americans wanted, uh, you know, some press reporter asked him, "Would you, would you give uh, basis to America to fight the Taliban or to fight the terrorism in Afghanistan?" He used the word uh, "no way" or something. He used uh, some word which was said uh, undiplomatic. Undiplomatic word. He said "no way" or some uh, impossible or some not possible. Yeah, he said not possible. Hmm. and uh, i think he said not possible no way so that was undiplomatic and he did uh, no you know when in international diplomacy the diplomats actually function in a manner that they don't say no directly to any country they just keep quiet mull over it they just keep quiet and come back they directly don't say no to any country and to america especially when it is a superpower lone superpower there is no need to for him to say no way or no not possible at all do you think so it was, was it, a mistake so it it, yeah. it was more it, do you think that was more for his uh, 
लोकल नो नो इट इज सॉर्ट ऑफ आई वुड से मेरे इमरान खान इमरान खान कैरेक्टर इज लाइक दैट ही ही इज द नो he is not in that category what you are saying that to keep people happy it was his own mindset he right. he has a bit of you know personal arrogance i would put it that way mm-hmm. that he did not meet the ca director because he thought no ca director is not in my level why should i meet him i meet the president of america something like that yeah now the americans were unhappy obviously with this but then uh, the no uh, conspiracy by no international con- conspiracy can succeed when uh, till the time the there is no helping hand within the country hmm. i would say that uh, say about 15 20 25% uh, role of the americans but 75% role is obviously of bajwa and his group okay. to in the removal of imran khan bajwa had I mean, but then, yeah but then he uh, bajwa would have been given assurances by the by the americans that okay if it, not nothing will happen to you know, the the aid that we're giving like there would have been some assurance on the united states as well because he you know, can't actually, just other, unilaterally take an action like other way around bajwa yeah. assured the americans that he will give whatever they want and uh, let us remove let let us you know get rid of imran khan so that so that's was, one good thing that imran was, khan was trying to do was like have a policy that was independent and for the interest of his own country but then he was sold out it seems like and now again it it seems like it will fall back to the policy of the best interests of the west and not of pakistan per se imran khan had other there are two three more activities that happened now imran khan in february when ukraine was attacked just when the attack was going in at that time imran khan visited russia and he met putin at that time that was also not liked by america i mean that was and, not his fault right it, he he didn't no, know that still, on on still, on this day the invasion will take place he had his plans but it but was <laughs> they did not like uh, pakistan to enter the russian sphere, sphere of influence yeah right that was the main thing now uh, in addition to this um, like what happened was that bajwa promised the americans that pakistan army will do whatever is required by the americans you don't worry you, imran khan will we will get rid of the uh, uh, american uh, diplomat who looks after the uh, you know official who looks after the uh, pakistan desk robert lu he told the pakistan ambassador in usa that uh, either you get rid of imran khan or we will make you know we will make life hell for pakistan something like that and uh, the uh, that is the letter which you are talking of which people are talking of the ambassador sent a letter to uh, the ministry of external affairs and this letter uh, uh, said that um, this is what the americans are saying and uh, which was taken as interference in pakistan affairs to look at it from the american angle or from any from any country's angle when a lone superpower it it has always been uh, you know getting into regime changes in an, in many countries not only in pakistan in many countries in the world right there have been efforts at regime changing regime, regime changes now this every country does to influence uh, tries to influence others by if the prime minister not under the influence they try to get rid of him and put another pliable person it's a normal system which works in the international arena there was nothing very great about it and nothing very you know that uh, there was a big conspiracy by america and all these conspiracies are ongoing in the world at, at all times so w- w- that was not very great so i don't value that uh, the americans were uh, you know after the, was were behind it and all yes they were behind it to some extent but then they had the they gave just the green signal to bajwa okay you manage it the pakistan army should manage the affairs and we are happy with that that's all in the the argument can be made that the americans did not need to do anything because they had someone who was willing to do all of that so they, if they can do a regime change without them getting involved at all why would they get more involved than it is needed the americans part. the americans have always been working closely with the pakistan army 
right from ayub khan era and uh, that they have not been uh, the political instability has been a constant feature in pakistan right from 1947 till date and the reliability of the politicians in the international sphere is also that we are not very good uh, they know that the uh, international sphere the pakistan army the reliability is much more red, especially for the americans so they work yeah, in collusion with the pakistan army that's a known fact yeah like we okay. discussed in our last podcast uh, democracies are messy it's easier to talk yeah. to one guy who he's the sole decision maker which is the army chief um so now let's talk about the current status of uh, no. current political no okay now bajwa and showed that this you know with 13 party alliance uh, imran khan was removed from power on 9th of april the the surprising part was that there was a conspiracy theory going on that uh, imran khan had decided to remove bajwa as the army chief and put another person left in general another person as the army chief in his place so 9th 9th 10th april night the supreme court has opened at, opened at midnight and uh, the order was passed to uh, the government that by the supreme court that the uh, government will not uh, tinker with anything with any activity and uh, the uh, constitutionality of the you know uh, removal of pakistan uh, of imran khan government was also accepted by the supreme court in the same time though the there was a lot of hustle uh, there was a lot of problems the speaker had already dissolved the assembly before the no confidence motion could be pushed through and all that there were a lot of issues which were there but final thing is that imran khan was removed and uh, shahbaz sharif government was put in place as shahbaz sharif as head of the government ppp and total 13 parties were part of that system right. okay now bajwa was now totally in control of this government during this time only there were uh, there was this uh, uh, number 2 of al qaeda in afghanistan who was then uh, killed in a drone attack and there was a drone attack uh, in somewhere else also in afghanistan in balochistan remote areas it was suspected during this time and there was a talk that uh, the pakistan Uh, army had given air space usage to americans to carry out this drone attack on in afghanistan in kabul on al zaiman i think al what's his name i'm forgetting the number 2 of al qaeda who was okay. uh, knocked out in kabul now bajwa huh? al zawahiri al zawahiri yeah. yeah he was the person so uh, now what happened was that the, the shahbaz sharif government was now in now try to put pressure on pakistan army on bajwa to give more powers to them to allow them to work in uh, more independently they in the meantime on 9th april when uh, the government was removed people automatically came to the street to the streets because they realized that they are the uh, corrupt set which was already disgraced was being put in place by the uh, establishment the pakistan army is called the establishment in pakistan and uh, the uh, honest prime minister was being removed imran khan did not uh, call for this uh, you know people to come out to the streets people came out on their own and then imran khan realized that yes people are with him and gradually he built up his support support he started uh, going to the people he started talking he started holding rallies and uh, then he got into this july 25th march he ordered uh, he decided to carry out a march from lahore to islamabad wherein there were a lot of atrocities on his people his women and children were fired upon uh, thousands of uh, these uh, gas shells were uh, fired uh, on on peaceful protesters peaceful peaceful people marching to islamabad which was not uh, to the liking of anyone in fact and this uh, disgraced the government as well as the pakistan army because the uh, regulars were not in not in uh, use there but the uh, the pakistan uh, rangers the rangers were there 
and the frontier constabulary that is again pakistan army officer both these both these are pakistan army officers and uh, they were used extensively by the central government on the in the july 25 atrocities okay okay yeah no i was just uh, pointing out that uh, a lot of his rallies that we see the videos of there they are re uh, reminiscent of the Trump rallies, the Trump MAGA rallies that he was doing uh, for his 2016 campaign, and then a then a 2020 campaign where there's like mass num a number of people coming in, and is and there's like network effects, right? Where once you see so many people out there, a lot more people start to get uh, get along and Imran join Khan, the movement. Yeah, Imran Khan has uh, his support base from the very beginning when the Pakistani diaspora. In the uh, outside Pakistan, the diaspora 99% supports, the uh, 95% I would say supports uh, Pakistan, uh, supports Imran Khan's party, and they are the ones who fund him. Also, the, it is quite surprising that he has held, you know, almost make, I think it's about uh, close to 100 rallies or something, in political rallies, big rallies, and uh, there is no dearth of funds. He has not had any dearth of funds and they've tried to investigate Imran Khan, his political party, his systems from every angle. They have not been able to find any major, to pin any major scandal to him or to his party to that okay. extent. Now, his popularity has been growing with every incident of uh, the government and the uh, uh, Bajwa Kotri, I would say, trying to suppress uh, popular, you know, sentiment and Imran Khan, the his uh, graph, popular popularity graph has been rising. It was earlier low. Now people say that he will get two thirds to three fourths majority when elections take place. That is why the Shabash Sharif government is trying to not get into elections at all. Whereas uh, Imran Khan has been asking for elections from the very beginning that hold fresh elections because this these people don't have uh, the popular mandate. They don't have the mandate, right? So wait, um, when those atrocities were happening on the people who were marching from Lahore to Islamabad, the army chief was Bajwa at that time or were Asif Muni? No, no, you know, no, army chief was Bajwa. This was Bajwa. July 25th. Uh, um, okay. Bajwa retired on November 29th. Okay. So yeah. let's let's talk about this. So whenever the elections happen, what which scenario is more favorable from an Indian perspective? if an election happens and obviously there'll be interference from the uh, uh pakistani army on this case uh if first scenario if imran khan wins and he gets like two third or a three fourth majority so very stable very strong stable government that's that's scenario number one or if it's like he gets he makes a government but with the like the the previous government that he made where it was coalition based or it was very slim margins or if he just loses and uh, either Bhutto's or, uh, or no, not not Bhutto's, but Zardari's or the Sharif's, they come into power. Which scenario would be the best scenario for from an Indian perspective, for yeah. you know more more peaceful coexistence uh, between the two countries? Yeah, just let us first relate the personalities. The personalities on the opposite sides are Zardari cannot uh, his party cannot come to power independently. So let us drop Zardari for the time being. There is only the Sharif family, Shabazz Sharif and Nawaz Sharif, and versus Imran Khan. Only two political contenders for the top post, top slot. Okay. Nawaz Sharif has, you know, always uh, been uh, having trying to have good relations with uh, the Indian government. It was during Nawaz Sharif's time that uh, Vajpayee visited. Lahore, the Lahore Declaration composite of composite dialogue was formed in 1998, I think, and that uh, Lahore bus service was uh, sort of started, or uh, that uh, Delhi Lahore bus service was started. Samjota, or I don't know what they, I think it is Samjota, uh, Samjota Express. Express was also Samjota Express also started, and the bus service was also started. Mm -hmm. Vajpayee visited Lahore with, and there was a composite dialogue declaration which was signed by the two prime ministers. Right. Okay. And after that also, when Parvez Musharraf also tried to get close to uh, the Vajpayee government, but then he was not successful. Today, even today also it is said, see, the Imran Khan 
is a corrupt politician. It is well known. The entire family is totally corrupt. Imran Khan is a corrupt politician. Sorry, not Imran Khan, Nawaz Sharif. Nawaz Sharif, okay. sorry, by mistake. <laughs> No, was like, that, 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 that's sort of like the, the, the whole conversation we're having just falls apart. No, is a totally, totally corrupt politician. And for corrupt, corrupt politicians to be, it is very easy to, you know, it is not very difficult to handle such politicians by the international community. It's not very difficult. So Americans have a lot of control over Nawaz Sharif and uh, they would... Uh, at all times, prefer Nawaz Sharif to be in power, in place of Imran Khan. Indian uh, intelligence agencies have close working relationship with Americans, and uh, that is how, uh, independently also, the Indian uh, intelligence agencies and the present national security advisor to the Indian Prime Minister Modi, uh, Mr. Doval, Ajit Doval, he is also uh, ha he also has a close, uh, you know. Uh, he also keeps a close watch and close control over uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, family. So they have a lot of controls. Uh, in, in the Indian, uh, Indian side would prefer Nawaz Sharif to Imran Khan any day from this angle. Okay. And uh, the other angle is Pakistan army. It is well known that uh, whosoever comes to power, Pakistan army will play a decisive role. And the Pakistan army under Bajwa, till Bajwa was there, Pakistan army was trying to establish good relations with India. They were trying to open bridges with India, which Imran Khan was not allowing to, for them to, allowing for it to happen. To, Bajwa wanted, was trying to, you know, bring in peace and start trade with America, with India, sorry. Cross-border trade also he wanted to restart that uh, also was uh, not allowed by Imran Khan. He said that till the time the Kashmir problem is resolved, we will have no talk with okay. India. So he stuck on that stand. Talking of Imran Khan, Imran Khan uh, is a person who cannot be controlled by anyone in one sentence. Okay, he cannot be controlled by any agency. And uh, if he gets two-thirds or three-fourths majority, he will put Pakistan army in place and Keep it only as a professional army, the, the job which a professional army is supposed to do. He will ensure that the Pakistan army gets into that mode only and gets away from the political activities and from all other activities which it is into in Pakistan. Say, for instance, do, he achieves three, four that, Sorry, sorry. To that extent, Imran Khan is, uh, you know, will be more serious threat in the in this manner to india india would not like imran khan to come to power in the whereas in the other context if i if i look at it from a democracy point of view the then there will be a vibrant pakistan, democracy in pakistan a vibrant democracy in india and both democracies would like to live in peace so there is when a peace deal is signed with such a with such a personality such a uh, such an uh, you know a popular figure then that will be an everlasting, uh, you know, uh, peace agreement between the two countries. To that extent, I would say that people-to-people -people relations would improve, and under Imran Khan, better, in a better way, with uh, no, you know, establishment not coming in the way of things and uh, trying trying its own machinations. Yeah. So the road to real peace goes through Imran Khan because he's the one who can this sort of the... create Pakistan a real democracy and not Nawaz Sharif. You know, they, they've tried to do it and it keeps on creating this. Yeah. Uh, the Pakistan military comes in and all the interference. And the Pakistan military also has this own, in, on its core, it, the, the, the core existence of it is comes from the threat from India. Yeah. So they are incentivized to keep that, that threat alive. Otherwise, what's the point? Why are they so important is because of the threat from India. Yeah, this is what I feel. My personal opinion is what I said. Right. But uh, the Pakistan army would not like this to happen. And uh, to look at it from the Indian intelligence uh, service and the Indian armed forces uh, angle also, an unstable Pakistan is always OK with India because an unstable Pakistan, internally unstable Pakistan, can do nothing to India. So therefore, to that extent, it is an unstable foe is always a good thing for any country hmm. that is also a feature to be content there are complex issues like pa pakistan remains an unstable foe if if it co continues to have 
interference from the Pakistani military into its political affairs, yeah. right? Uh, so from that point of view, also Im Imran Khan would not be a good uh, good candidate. Although, I mean, morally, idealist, idealistically speaking, I think if the Pakistan if, becomes a democracy, there'll be. Let's be frank that Imran Khan ke saath, the present BJP government will not be able to establish repo with Imran Khan. Yeah, I mean, he's, the he's called them the Nazis. The characters are different. The total, the is, characters are totally he's different. He's literally called them Nazis. Like, at yeah. if you use that word, there is no going back from there. Like, you hmm. can't have any diplomatic channels. If you call that, the... That is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, right. The, these people, uh, with Imran Khan, the present government, uh, BJP government, will not be able to create any channels of importance, and, vital importance. And, Im and Imran Khan's sort of like point of view is more around like the is Islamization, right? Uh, he wants to get closer to Turkey and then create like a is strong Islamic bloc. He wants to get close to Malaysia. Obviously, getting uh, aid and external support from China is always there. But he has this is Islamization angle that he wants to follow like create the old ottoman empire and you know and, and and be a part of that and that's his thought process right so I, india does not come into picture of that no i would slightly disagree with this okay. imran khan is not the islamized islamization type of a person he wants no i uh, he wants some, sorry uh, yeah yeah no i i i didn't mean that he wants to like islamize the population, but more around getting all of the Islamic countries together and form, yeah, and yeah, form an Islamic is. block. That's what I was The Islamic yeah. block can be, you know, there are two aspects to uh, forming an Islamic. One is the Turkey model, and the other right. is the Saudi model or the Iran model. He is not in favor of the Iran and Saudi models, but he is in favor of the Turkish model. That is the progressive Islamic, you know, where the religion remains uh, uh, remains in the. Uh, on the sidelines, religion does not come into play to that extent. But then, because of religion, they are together. Right. That is, the togetherness is because of religion. But the religion remains on the sidelines; it doesn't come into play. Yeah, there's no political interference no, no. from the religious side. Yeah. It's that's more yeah. of a social construct, and it yeah. just remains in that. Okay. Yeah. Where do you to that, to that extent? He's not a threat to even the Americans. That uh, he will pose. A, an Islamic threat to America. No, he does not pose any threat to any country to that extent. Because he wants a Turkish model to be in place in Pakistan. Just one sec. Right. Turkish model to be placed to be in place in Pakistan, wherein people benefit from the from governance and the country develops into a you know into a developing good thriving economy. That is what his interest is. Okay. And beyond that, uh, he is it does not Maybe tomorrow he may pose a threat, or the country may pose a threat if it becomes too powerful. That's a later stage, but not today. Yeah. Okay. Now I was just saying that uh, you you mentioned that scenario where he Im Imran Khan gets two third or three fourths majority, and then he puts the Pakistan army in place. How does that? If you go through like the right. steps on right. the, how does that work? Uh, let me, let me, it, let me put it right. different. Let me put it differently. This uh, let me answer it differently rather. General Asim Munir is uh, trying to get hold of the army. And let's talk of Asim Munir first because he's the man in picture in the center of the activities. Asim Munir is not seemingly he's not very happy with the DGISI President DGISI Anjum Najim hmm. and uh, he wants to replace him and his men. The uh, there have been, there was this uh, Ashrad Sh Arshad Sharif uh, journalist, famous journalist of Pakistan, who was hounded from the country by ISI, directly threatened by ISI that uh, you leave the country. From Dubai also, he was uh, uh, asked to vacate to go to leave Dubai also within 48 hours. He went to Kenya again. He was he was sent to a place uh, where they wanted him to go where it was easy to eliminate him. They finally, they knocked him out. Ashur Sharif's mother has clearly named DGISI, General Bajwa, General Nasir, Major General Nasir, who was the DGC, they call him, they call him DGC. And uh, 
these people as the persons who have masterminded the plot against uh, uh, in the killing of Arshad Sharif. Nawaz Sharif has a case against him and his daughter, that is Mariam Nawaz, uh, or case against him in the same on the same in the same contest in UK. There is a person from their party PMLN, Tasneem, Sayyid Tasneem. He has admitted that he has been part of the parlay's discussions wherein Nawaz Sharif had clearly said that uh, we want this uh, these two people to be removed, Arshad Sharif and uh, this uh, and Imran Khan to be eliminated. And there is a money trail which goes from London to Kenya. That is also uh, a proven fact. The can I talk about this incident, or Shad Sharif incident for some no, time? No, I was, I was, I was yeah. uh, just wondering how that connects with uh, the Pakistan military being taken it care connects, of. If he has it connects, it connects with that because the it is the first time that the mother of the deceased person has directly implicated, directly said that I want an FIR to be launched. She has filed a case in Supreme Court for this. I want an FIR case to be lost against the DGISI, the Army Chief, and the DGC. The these people and he, she has named some other persons or some more people also that uh, these people are the ones who have killed my son she has clearly said similarly imran khan has openly named jan bajwa dgisi and jan nasir that these are the people who have been uh, he has actually asked for jan nasir to be uh, his name to be put in the fir not bajwa's name per se but he has asked for General Nasir's name to be put in the FIR, okay. uh, Imran Khan. So this uh, tussle is already on. Asim Munir is trying to, now let us come to Asim Munir. He is, does not presently, is not in control of the situation at present in, within the Pakistan army. The generals are not in agreement with him on many issues. He tried to, he has only been able to change the uh, core commander of uh, Rahul Pindi Corps. That's all, because that is the core which uh, which is uh, which controls the coups in the country. Yeah. He has not been able to bring about any more changes. He has tried to contain the political activities of uh, the uh, ISI, which is not which he has not been able to. People say that he is trying to control, but he has not been able to control. He has not been able to have any say within the. Uh, Pakistan army, the uh, core commanders are in, they are uh, six years of Bajwa rule. He has put his own people as uh, in most places. So those people are uh, Bajwa in a way still calling the shots through those people. Asim Munir will take some more time, three, four months, I would say, to take control of the military. To <clears throat> That uh, to this extent, the Pakistan army is presently being run in the same pattern as it was being run by uh, during the tenure of General Bajwa, that they are hounding Imran Khan and his people. They are trying political, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, engineering, political engineering. They have been doing political engineering earlier also. They are now also continuing with political engineering. And they are in, trying to ensure that Imran Khan does not come to power and elections are delayed as much as possible. Okay. okay. This is uh, this is what it is. And if there are two uh, situations which can do it. Nobody till now has been able to clearly elucidate what is in the mind of Asim Munir. Till the time, till today, nobody knows for clear what is in his mind. Maybe he is uh, alone, or he is keeping his cards to, to his uh, close to his chest. But then the army chief controls everything, so gradually he will take control of the situation. I am sure, and uh, he should logically allow elections to be held in a fair and free and fair manner, wherein Imran Khan will come to power. He seemingly the way it, he is working, he seemingly is not interested in political activities but then people say that he does not like imran khan asim so, does not like imran khan hmm. so there are there is this is a very complex situation yeah but the then if, if, if imran khan comes to power how how does he so 
the Pakistani army still will be strong. It, no, it doesn't matter if he has the, the backing of three fourths of no, the country. No, there, the problem is the problem comes in that to amend the constitution and to bring in order to bring changes, you require two thirds majority, in some cases, three fourths majority in the, in the parliament. If Imran Khan is allowed these two thirds, then Imran Khan will ensure that the judiciary plays its role in a proper manner and the Pakistan army plays its role in a proper manner in, in the manner in which it is designed to play, not in the manner in, in which it is playing now. By amending so, the constitution? By not only amending the constitution, by taking control of the things. He would first put, I would feel that he would first put the judiciary, uh, like he would first uh, empower the judiciary to ensure that the judiciary is independent. And he would then, you know, start disbanding the ISI. The political wins of ISI. He would not have, he, as a prime minister, he cannot have that disband this. I don't want this DG ISI to uh, do this internal work at all. He has to just disband or he has to just force them out. Yeah. And ISI works. The ISI works under the prime minister. So therefore, the prime minister can bring all changes to the ISI. As soon as he changes the ISI, Pakistan army changes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, technically ISI works under the prime minister, but everyone knows that it works under the army. So as soon as he starts to bring changes into the ISI, there'll be there'll be another coup. So and it it won't matter no. if he has third, three, fourth majority, two third majority. They'll just do another coup because as soon the, as the, the Pakistani military sees that their power is being take, taken away by this guy, it it's like they have the stick. As long as they have the stick, what can the no, population do? The stick it? the stick is now too weak. The stick yeah. is now too weak. The Pakistan public has now, you know, woken up. The Pakistan public is picking up. The Pakistan public is not going to take things lying down anymore. It is very clear on the ground. The uh, the public is still not, you know, totally woken up. But then, <clears throat> it I am sure that the Pakistan public will is going to is not going to accept any more of uh, nonsense beyond control from the Pakistan army. So the gradually the Pakistan army will have to recede and uh, give way to give space, educate space to the political uh, exec executive authority to take control of the state. I mean, that that's the I same thing. That was, that, that's the same thing that was happening in uh, East Pakistan in 1970, 1971, where, the, where, the, where there was public outcry against them. And uh, but the Pakistani military came in and they suppressed all of that outcry. They they the, the, like massive bad things that they did. But in that case, there was India that would come in and you know liberate East Pakistan and form Bangladesh. But now India can't come in that right? because of, because Pakistan now has tactical nukes. Right. So it's not like an external power the, can come in. The, and they the could be, they could still suppress the whole thing. I agree with this. There are these are views and counter views. My I look at things in a positive light from the Pakistan point of view. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, people in India. Uh, I keep reading that that they are talking of disintegration of Pakistan. Now yeah. disintegration of Pakistan. Let me. I mean, my personal view is disintegration of Pakistan is not going to happen. Pakistan is not going to default because the Americans are ensuring that Pakistan comes on its knees and does what America wants. That is how all these activities are taking place. That is how their economy is going down, down and down. The economy is not being allowed to come up because the government is not trying to revive the economy. Hmm. The government is not working. The government is blackmailing the Pakistan army that we will put, uh, we will take tough decisions in the economic front after you dis you ensure that imran khan is out of con uh, is uh, is out of contest in the political arena either he is disqualified or he is thrown out or he is put in jail or whatever till that time imran khan is there the uh, shahbaz sharif government is going to continue to blackmail pakistan army that the economy we are not going to work on the economic front till that time this happens this is one aspect the second aspect is the the indian People, we feel that uh, Pakistan will disintegrate and the Pakistan army, you know, is going to face a revolt from the public within internally Pakistan army is going to face a revolt. I feel that 
personally that there is nothing of this kind that is going to happen. Sooner or later elections will take place. Sooner or later Imran Khan will come to power. And once he comes to power, gradually, he has never talked against the Pakistan army till date. He has talked against only General Bajwa, nobody else. Okay. Okay. So he, he himself would like Pakistan army to be strong, but to be strong for the purpose for which it is designed, not for the for political, you know, that uh, engineering, or not for political engineering or for, yeah. for management of the state in the arena in which it is not designed to, to work. So, okay. so will Pakistan default or not? So it will, do you think under the current scenario, I think they, they have very little uh, foreign reserves? They have very little foreign reserves, but they have friends. Saudi Arabia is there, UAE is there. UAE is already uh, given them $2 billion or something yeah. a few days back. They are giving, they promised $1 billion more. Saudi Arabia is there. America will nudge these people to ensure that Pakistan just remains at the borderline but does not default. And uh, yeah. and what they what um, what the US or the those governments they'll get out of that is that Pakistan will do whatever they have they've been told. Pakistan so, uh, Pakistan moves away from China. The uh, Pakistan's uh, it is the international scenario which is uh, you know ensuring instability in Pakistan. Hmm. China America rivalry is at its peak, is peaking rather. Russia is uh, fighting it in Ukraine. America is in, trying to ensure that Russia gets stuck, badly stuck in Ukraine. So all those are affecting Pakistan too. Pakistan, by the way, has been supplying weapons to Ukraine. That's a fact. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So Pakistan army has been quietly supplying weapons to Ukraine at the behest of Americans. Oh, oh yeah. After the oust, what, oust what America, Khan, yeah, yeah. what America wants is that Pakistan should wean away from China, CPC should be dropped, and Pakistan should allow the uh, uh, air bases etc. or whatever they want to for Afghanistan to be taken control of by America again in a different manner, not by physically putting their boots there, but in in a manner in which Americans. American force is not there, but the Americans are able to uh, ensure adequate control over Afghanistan. Don't they do not want China to enter Afghanistan. Yeah. But and they don't they want China to be moved away, to be moving away from Pakistan. So Pakistan mm -hmm. is stuck in that quagmire. That is why Americans are trying to, you know, Americans are ensuring that through this government that uh, Pakistan economy goes in shambles. And it will take years for Pakistan to recover. And that time, Pakistan will go with on uh, bent knees to beg for help from America and from other countries, which it will give on its terms. That is how the situation is. And it will remain like that. The Indian th wishful thinking that Pakistan will disintegrate, I am very clear in this, that no state disintegrates in this manner. I mean, disintegrate. also, also it's, it's going to be a bad thing for India if, I mean, that's my own thought process on this. Correct me if I'm wrong. If Pakistan disintegrates, it creates instability in in the region, and there'll be a lot of that fallout will come into India as well. This the borders are porous. Uh, no, a lot no. of terrorist ac activities, a lot of terrorist organizations, they they form their hold within Pakistan as well. If the even, government even America will not be able to control that situation. Right. Okay, so nobody wants a totally unstable system, a totally unstable, unpredictable uh, right. you know, activity to be there in any country. So yeah, let's so not managed. let's not do any wishful thinking. <laughs> Pakistan is so, going to remain in place, but yeah. a weak Pakistan for some years to come. Because uh, when Imran Khan, when and if he comes to power, he will try to rebuild Pakistan the way he wanted. He wants to rebuild it. It will take some years because the because of the devastation and destruction that has been caused in the last nine months in Pakistan economy, mm -hmm. as such by the Shahbaz Sharif government. Now, mm -hmm. let us, as from the Pakistani point of view and from the South Asian point of view also, I would feel that uh, uh, positive outcome of the present uh, political influx should be such that elections are held in Pakistan, political stability comes to Pakistan. Imran Khan does not want war with India. 
he is not interested in any war with india he is not interested in uh, any other activity except for he says that i will talk to india only when india agrees to talk on kashmir etc etc or it under uh, unders whatever it is whatever has been done in kashmir in the last few years right that's a different ball game okay but uh, expecting iran if expecting uh, imran khan to get into war mode immediately no it is not in the horizon on the horizon yeah great so uh, so it seems like we have uh, we've we've covered the possible outcomes we've covered political landscape political instability within pakistan and uh, i mean we ob- obviously hope that good things happen uh, because yeah. you know the people who who live there are, are also like us they also want yeah. they 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 also want just a better life just like anyone else in the world yeah right yeah. so we hope that that happens for them and whatever way they choose should happen and it should be their say right it 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 should not be dictated by some other some external force that comes in which has their own interest in mind should be done by them also them only yeah. can right. i add one more point can i add one sure. more but just one point absolutely yeah the <clears throat> economy is being kept in shambles by the shahbaz sharif government not only for the american interest american interest is different but the economy is held in shambles by shahbaz sharif government to continue to blackmail pakistan army to not to hold elections and to remove pakistan from the scene right that's the major activity presently yeah remove imran khan from the scene they yeah, got that's yeah. right right okay and that only army can do well makes sense um anything else that you wanted to add i think we covered most of the topics that you wanted to discuss we'll be i think we'll be having a we we'll be having another discussion probably a short discussion on afghanistan and all the stuff that happened right from 80s and till now but that will yeah. be a separate conversation uh anything else that you wanted to add no nothing we can hold another uh, discussion on pakistan in say some you know few days time or something right i i think the Because one thing the that political, we, political activities are taking place at a fast pace in pakistan yeah and then one thing that we could not uh, address was the ttp and how does that come we we'll, get we'll keep it for the next we'll keep it right. for the next yes okay <laughs> it is better right uh, well uh, thanks everyone for listening and thank you for taking out the time dad uh, this was a, a wonderful conversation i also learned a lot uh, there's so much nuances to these conversations and there's so much com- complexity that this Uh, a a lot of gray area there's not one single answer to any of the questions and in in, yeah. in a lot of cases we don't even know what the question is so uh, thanks for this and thanks for taking up the time thank you thanks a lot everyone thank you nice of you